you will have David and Alexandra. So welcome. Thank you so much, Susanna. Um, <clears throat> as you intimate, I am indeed delighted to be introducing and, and talking with David Morley this evening. Um, over 30 years, David has made really an extraordinarily sustained, intricately crafted, questing body of work, including um, collections such as scientific papers and the gypsy and the poet. Um, his selected poems, The Invisible Gift, won the Ted Hughes Award, which was no surprise at all. Um, and his new collection, Fury, which, as Susanna says, is, is just, just on the verge of being in your hands and, and in the shops, uh, is going to be published in two days' time. Um, and Orestes and, and the Furies are, are there behind the lettering. And there's something very tense, I think, about this sense of fury behind the cover, perhaps finding little windows to get out, but artfully shaped windows. Um, David is a trained ecologist, and I think one can feel in his work the deep, deep, knowledge of the natural world that underpins it. Um, <clears throat> he is, is an is a informed, imaginative voice articulating the flight of birds, the homes of midges, the habits of water, feeling for meeting points between art and science. Um, he's long been known and loved as a teacher and has for many years been professor of creative writing at the University of Warwick. In his poetry, he works with forms of extravagance, I think. He's a great cataloger of things, um, which I think is right for a zoologist. He gives us the encyclopedia plus some extra galaxies and anteaters. He stages and interrogates processions, rites, rhythms, speaking voices, forms of drama. And he's a magician with form, as we're going to hear this morning. Um, he makes patterns of etched precision, and yet creates on the, um, on the page the pell-mell, chancy energy, um, the rough and the high risk. He writes up into the air on a sort of thermal and unravels himself down to the ground again um, in ways I think are like nobody else. So welcome, David. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, it's good to see you all. And, uh, and thank you for coming to this uh, Meet the Poet, um, which... Um, I remember being advertised as a Jeremy Paxman style inquisition. But I don't think we're going to go there, are we, Alex? Really? <laughs> I, uh, let me just change the script. <laughs> I can do Jeremy Paxman if it's uh, desired. Uh, however, <clears throat> I think we might do a, a more sort of celebratory and less quizzical tone. Um, the book Fury opens um, with a sonnet, David, the first of your lyrebird poems. Um, a, a it's part of a series um, which, which performs a kind of call and response across the whole body of the, the book, teasing and, and imitating each other. Um, I wonder if you might uh, giving, give us an opening flight of, of birdsong um, and, and read the first sonnet and then we'll, we'll have a talk about it. Yeah, sure. First Lyrebird. Your vow is a lyrebird's thesaurus of mimicry. Your vow yaffles with the laughter of a cuckabur. Your vow sings the syllables you share with our children. Your vow lullabies a jungle's stories, canopies, and understory. My vow catapults a kingfisher past a kookaburra. My vow scales a frozen waterfall's icicled aviary. My vow strips a eucalyptus for nests of rainbow lorries. My vow ploughs a ridgewall to a peat bog slog and slurry. Your vow paints Jane Austen's miniatures on two inches of ivory. Your vow quickens a bare forest with your footsteps in snow. 
Your vow spills its watershed through the fells, tarns and freshets and startles snowdrops from the floor of heaven. My vow hushes a fir forest and my footsteps in snow. My vow spies a single star from out the wide night's numbers. Thank you. And, and thank you for those measured numbers. Um, I have been looking up lyrebirds in advance, but it's conceivable that there are some people out there who are not quite sure what the link between this poem and a lyrebird might be. Could you give us a little portrait of a lyrebird and tell us why it, um, it made you want to write in response to it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, David Attenborough has this description of lyrebirds. I won't read the whole, but he says that the lyrebird sings one of the longest, most melodious and complex of all bird songs. Uh, they're superlative mimics. Uh, some individuals have territories close to those occupied by human dwellings. Uh, uh, they're, they're, by the way, they're an Australian bird and they've really been uh, hard struck by the forest fires. Uh, but they include in their performances the uh, accurate imitations of, of all sorts of other birds like kookaburras, sure, uh, but also uh, such things as spot welding machines, burglar alarms, and camera motor drives. I just love the way that they mimic, they mimic the, well, the natural world and the kind of the man-made world too. But it was also a poem that included a lot, a lot of uh, debts to not just to the natural world, but particularly to women mm. poets um, and writers, um, such as Jane Austen, um, Emily Dickinson, uh, Vishlava Simborska, uh, Elizabeth Bishop, Charlotte Bronte, um, Marion Moore, Frida Kahlo, um, who have been huge enabling influences upon me and my development as a writer. Um, <clears throat> I think it was Rachel Long who was talking in a Meet the Poet a few weeks ago, where she said that uh, women poets were given her permission to write um, what, she, what, she, what she liked, uh, what she liked to write. And I remember watch, watching her saying that, I'm thinking, yeah, that, that's, um, that's most certainly the case for me. And this poem celebrates, celebrates that. Um, you mentioned form earlier. Um, this poem um, is a series of seven sonnets. It's, you might call it half a corona, or half a crown of, of sonnets. And because there's li linking lines, they do all tie together. But that's because it was firstly written as a pantoum, which is a Malayan form in which um, lines, lines are knitted as they go down the page. They, they repeat as they go down the page. Usually a pantoum is about 20 lines. But I wanted to try something longer to see where the poem would go, where the poem takes over, like, like Caroline Bird said last, last week, where the poem, find, the poem finds a, a clearing in the forest of words. Um, so I ended up writing um, hundreds of lines, and then the poem fell into a 98 line pantu, um, which I've got a copy of, by the way, here, because it required a lot of co copying and pasting but not on a computer, it required physical copying it, like, um, like making a sculpture almost, or a kind of a sound sculpture. So it looks, um, there were many drafts of this. Um, this is just one uh, where, you know, the poem, the poem is stuck together here and it kind of, it forms this long, really messy piece of writing. Um, uh, oh, the couplets always stay, is it the couplets that always stay together and you're moving the couplets into different places? Or yeah, the single whole, lines, whole the single lines are separated by about three lines. But one of the things I wanted to do with it, like the, that the lyrebird itself, was rather than uh, mimic the lines uh, completely, it was to just take the sound of the lines mm -hmm. and change the nouns uh, and verbs and uh, adverbs, change almost every single part of the speech of that line and make it a different vow that was progressing down through the poem. 
And then once I got to the end of this pontoon and stitched the whole thing together into a vast piece of kind of word tapestry, um, I realised that actually it really divided into sonnets. And because of the repeating lines, it had the, um, the, the chance, the, it gave it the chances of rhyme. It, the, all the rhymes were already there because of the repeated lines of sounds. Um, so there was a great deal of happenstance in how it occurred. Um, and I had, <clears throat> I, don't always, I don't always have fun writing poems. Um, the, the work that goes into rewriting a poem hundreds of times isn't always fun. Um, you never know what's going to happen. Uh, but I had lots of fun with this. Um, mm -hmm. I was, it was, there was lots of things that kept kicked back at me all the time and, and taught me. It taught me about about how I was feeling, about um, the way to whom the poem is being addressed as well. Because mm. it's not um, a personal poem about myself, it's, a, it's actually a love poem. And, and did this, this person approve of all, of all their vows? Um, I, hope, I hope so. I, just, <laughs> I wish you'd, I well, say there were more. And, um, uh, but uh, you know, she's a person who improves, who approves of um, <clears throat> kind of the technical stuff about the poem too, which is which is great. But also the way that the image are, are refracted and diffracted and yeah. Yeah. all the way down. Um, and so you know, it is um, a poem of of debt, as I said at the beginning of debt. Yeah, I'm so I'm so interested in this idea of talking about influence and and debt and acknowledgement in relation to in relation to a bird that picks up a sound and changes it. I've, I, I don't know anybody who's done that be before. And, and in a way, it's a sort of cartoonish vision of this, um, this bird using the, the um, burglar alarms and sirens and chainsaw sounds. And you've shifted it into something very subtle and beautiful about picking a, a, a phrase from Elizabeth Bishop and, and making your acknowledgement to Dickinson. It's, it, it's, it's a very amazing subtle shift from uh, bird life to poetic life. Um, there's an interesting question here before we move on from Liebert, um from Andrew Jackson, thank you Andrew, um, about the way that you've positioned the poems in the book and I suspect you thought about this a, a great deal um, and he wonders whether perhaps they, they work as stopping points on the road or as musical motifs. Do either of those work for you as, as analogies? That's, those are, that's a very good analogy. Um, stopping places being in Romany what we call action tans where the, the, the whole book can basically slow down and reflect upon itself a little bit. Um, but also, yes, musical. I'm very interested, and I always have been, in the poem as music, as word music, but also as music too. Um, and also, I've always been interested, well, I've always, I can't help myself, since I was a young poet, of seeing a book as a form in itself. Um, I've always been interested in symphony as well, um, and that the whole poem is like contains movements that have motifs and light motifs that work across the book. And those are sound motifs, not just images, but all those are kind of patternings that go through. Um, the other thing too is simply, um, let's just go straight to that title, Fury. These, these little sonnets are not furious poems. They talk about some of the fury of the natural world, this natural fury of creation and expression. But they're not uh, the received uh, definition of fury. And there are poems in this book which evince that kind of fury. And I, I, like, I enjoyed the fact that one could just inject that fury and rein it and bring it uh, into focus because, you know, we have, you know the phrase blind fury, I didn't want it to be blind, I want it to be one that saw and, and perceived and understood the nature of fury. I, th I think we'll keep coming back along the way to different modulations, different forms and feelings about, about 
fury, David. I wonder <clears throat> at this early stage whether we should bring in a poem that raises one of your, you know, really abiding subjects, um, which is which is Romani culture. Um, we've mentioned it already in the stopping places. Um, the throne voice is a sort of verse drama, a, sh a short verse drama, um, but it is one, and um, and and raises these questions about whose voice we're hearing. We hear uh, a magician's voice just coming at us through the night and we can't quite see him. Um, I wonder if you could, could read us a little bit from the throne voice. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, the, the poem is um, a, long, a long poem, but it's only about the size of a short, short story. Mm. Uh, there are lots of short, short stories in, the, in this book, uh, which are character driven. And I, uh, I grow to love my characters and, and their invention and trust, trust their ability to say the poem wouldn't have anything said on their behalf. So the magician is talking as the poem opens. <clears throat> the story starts with who you are. I strode at night across the heath to hear a night jar. It was night which throws her voice inside a bird. I would stand below his song and become cast into creature, into his pearled world. The bird could never be seen. It seemed a soft scar of sound, as if a lone tree's bark sang the night's wound from a lone tree's bough. And yet heath and bird were grown too in the dark. Those wound, wounded voices were thrown into me as if bird and tree were hornbucks I could finger and trace and sing aloud. Spirit through night, or night through me, and all the creatures of the night sang free. My gypsies gave tongue to campfire stories, but my spell drew speech from the circling heath. I was a magician to them the magic man to my people. I lost it. I lost my magic and I lost those voices. I cried my eyes out. I've cried my eyes into myself. How can you know what it is like to lose your magic? Thank you, David. <clears throat> you evoke so powerfully the, the campfire, the community, the presence of the voices and their loss and a position between community and utter loneliness. Is it that in-betweenness somehow that grips you in, in the way that you write uh, gypsy characters? Well, I've always been between cultures and languages and trying to find the language in <clears throat> the language behind the language, mm. uh, particularly in Romany. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scientist trained as, and a poet. Um, <clears throat> I'm kind of half in and half out of culture. Uh, my poems are half in one language and half in another uh, and kind of drenched in the natural world and yet driven by human character. Um, so kind of inness and outness is definitely something uh, that I can't, uh, I can't be rid of. Mm -hmm. And which certainly made me, when I was younger, deeply uncomfortable. Um, I think it gave me a bit of a psychological battering, actually, when I was younger. Um, but I think there's a reconciliation within uh, poems. I mean, um, speech, and 
um, and another in the sonata, this is speech and a stammer. Um, as you know, I have, a, I have a stammer, a very severe stammer, though this is not going to come across because I have so many ways of um, working around it. The, the source of mimicry, in fact, that's what that is. Um, it's between speech, speech and stammer, um, eloquence and silence, um, but also speaking through character. Um, rather than through myself. And yet that magician and his speech could so easily have been a personal poem. And I don't think you could write entirely in character without also writing about yourself. Can I just say one thing, by the way, just as an adjunct to this, is that um, there's a couple of poets on the, on the forward uh, shortlist who, who I, whose work I know well and who I've taught with, and who I think are fantastic. Caroline Bird, I've taught an Arvin Foundation course with her, she's an amazing poet. And Pascal Petit, who's also on our shortlist, I've taught with her at Tenuith, the National Centre for Writing in Wales. And that poem, The Throne Voice, had its little germ of inspiration in the first workshop that she did, and of course we did, where we were looking at um, of almost surreal observations where you bring one noun together with another thing. I remember sitting in the workshop and doing that and that image of the snail, the, you know, I cried my eyes into myself. I remember that just being the seed that began the kind of growth of this long poem. Just a little bit of the notebook where I came back from that centre and Pascal's workshop had started that poem. So, hey, you know, you teaching can give you enormous rewards as a writer if you actually take part, if you take it, you participate in it. And you've talked about teaching is the most important task of, of the poet, I think, and um, <clears throat> it's, it's great to feel that that background behind the the campfire story, as it as it were. Can we can we talk a little bit more about the way you use Romany language? You don't, I mean, you this poem, the throne voice, is all in in English, but we're going to, I think, hear um, one of your poems in which you do use Romany, Anglo-Romany words. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a question which I think might, might trigger your extreme response, which is um, a very good one from Sarah McLeod, who starts by congratulating you on, on a book of great stories and spellbinding words, and, and asks about how you come to the mix of English and, and Romany. Um, do you write all in English and then change some words? Do you know immediately from the start which words are in, in which language? That's a, what a great question from Sarah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I could answer that at length. I'm going to have to digest it for the sake of this. Um, uh, uh, my, mother, my mother used a few Romany words when I was a child. Um, you know, Vado, Poshra, uh, Didikai. Um, and and, and uh, the, the comparison I make is R.S. Thomas. Um, when R.S. Thomas, the, the great Welsh poet, came to the age of 30, he started teaching himself Welsh. He gave, him, he gave himself permission to learn Welsh and start writing in Welsh too. Uh, although actually most of his poetry was in English. And it's about the same age when I was 30 that I suddenly started quite naturally to start using Romany in poems. Um, I gave myself permission to do so, having um, yeah, vo avoided it. And, and it came quite naturally, maybe not to me, but to the poems. And to answer Sarah, the words choose themselves. I do not write in English and then translate back, translate into Romany. I write in Romany first, but, but again, without going on too much about this, Romany as a language is incredibly interesting because it's a series of dialects. And those dialects are different for different countries and different times of history too. So I'm right, uh, when I have written a poem that was set in Eastern Europe in uh, the 19th century, I'm deliberately using a, a Romany dialect of that time and of that particular country, Bulgaria. And my poems in Anglo-Romany, if they're Victorian, are using Anglo-Romany 
Victorian, Man uh, Victorian Romany dialect, and those which are contemporary using a contemporary Romany dialect. So it's multiple di <clears throat> multiple dialects. Can I ask um, who you learnt from, David? Did you learn Did you learn those different dialects by being with different speakers? I learnt it from multiple sources, um, from from travellers. And from talking to, to uh, people who are working within this macaronic uh, speech, such as the, uh, again, who I met on an Arban course, actually, uh, a Romany writer called Damien Labar, whose amazing book, uh, Stopping Places, came out last year, um, with Dan Allam of the Romany Theatre Company. All these people are travellers uh, who, who use Romany speech. Um, but... Um, I, also, I, I without you know without doubt and without apology, I learned it, I learned it also from like R.S. Thomas from dictionaries uh, and and multiple different uh, you know dialects, um, whether that's Welsh Romany or Anglo Romany or Bulgarian Romany, I found it utterly fascinating. One of the things that's amazing about Romany is not just its um, sonic impact, because sometimes it's uh, sound of the the word is imitative of what it actually is um <clears throat> a magpie's kakaracci the sound it makes um the the uh words sometimes have double even triple meanings and all those meanings have to be in play within the poem um i always put glossaries on these poems with all those meanings in there, there there's a huge opportunity for kind of play within language and language behind the language and where characters are using this, they're using it quite deliberately. There's a great Romany phrase, which um, uh, I love, um, which is macaronic again, uh, which is, um, um, I swear now, neither banger nor tatcher, which means, I swear now, neither falsely nor truly. Um, there's another great phrase, which I find talismanic, Sorry, semen, semen, which means uh, we are all one, all who are with us are ourselves. Now that sounds great, doesn't it? All who are with us are ourselves, but it does contain that again a doubleness in there, which I find really interesting. Because if you're not with us, <laughs> then you're against us. That it's all in there, contained. Anyway, um, shall I read part of this poem? Um, <clears throat> Now this is in written in contemporary dialect. Um, uh, after the death of, as most of you know, after the death of a gypsy, um, their belongings and the caravan is considered to be unclean. Uh, the word is marime, marime, and they're, they're burned. And, and within this poem, I repeat a word called mernamos, which means silence. And I'm picking up here from uh, a Roma belief that writing something down is very dangerous and also can, can be sort of disloyal because you're giving away a secret. Um, for instance, after, after the uh, Roma Holocaust in the Second World War in which one million gypsies were, were annihilated, um, there's very little written history about that uh, persecution. And partly that's because this this uh, tragedy, which the Romans call pajaramos, which uh, which means the devouring, was regarded as marame, unclean, not to be talked of. Anyway, this poem is uh, after the burial of the gypsy matriarch. The the Roma are torching her proud vado in Myrnamos. The yag leaps into the burrow and billows in Myrnamos. Pato, Satlia, Petura, her possessions flare in Myrnamos. Heraclo shuffles a banker, palms them out in Myrnamos. The yag leaps into the burrow and billows in Myrnamos. Her lurcher is national from the Campo in Myrnamos. Heraclo shipples a banker, palms them out in Myrnamos. The Zucal peers and peers from the whoosh in Myrnamos. Her lurcher is Nashaval from the Campo in Myrnamos. Para, 
tower to their critzer, collapse in murmurs. What the Roma do not say to each other is buried in murmurs. Their vados circle a field, they vanish in murmurs. Pater, Satlia, Patura, everything burns in murmurs. What the Roma do not say to each other is buried in Mernamos. The Roma are torturing Hervado. Everything must burn. Even hearing you reading it makes me feel more intensely, I think, than I did reading it myself, how the relationship between the extreme intimacy of this one Vardo and, and the inventory of things that have to be burned from it gives us the inside of a single life. And yet you're bringing in this relationship to a, a whole people and to that Holocaust and, and this sussurus of um, silences at each line is both spoken and also unspoken. You're, you're keeping this very tense relationship between whether we should speak or whether we shouldn't speak. You're managing to be between those two somehow. Is, is that right? Yes. Um, do you know that Romani as a language is the only one that's not recognised in the uh, United Kingdom? There was a, I didn't know um, that. There was a campaign when Cameron was Prime Minister to try to get it recognised and he personally refused for this to happen. Um, <clears throat> when my uh, wife and I uh, first met, we went to the Bodleian Library in Oxford to sign up. And um, the Bodleian's got a very proud tradition that you can take the oath not to burn the books or damage the library. You can take that oath in any language. My wife being Welsh took it in Welsh. I requested Romany and they refused. <laughs> um, I have actually written a translation of the um, Bodleian Oath, which I'm going to put into my next book. Oh, good. Um, uh, and it all, um, astonishingly, it all rhymes as well, which is great. Mm. Um, and, you know, the instinct when that sort of thing happens is to burn the books. <laughs> um, and, in, yeah. <clears throat> and in counter to that, there's a way in which your poetry is, is sort of teaching us. I mean, I, because you use these forms, the pantum there, which do this knitting, this repetition of language, once we've gone to the gloss, we're, uh, by the time we get to the end of the poem, we really learn some words. So I, I think we can feel the, the teacher in you wanting to share this language too. Yeah, I do want to share Romany. I, uh, I think uh, <clears throat> Romany is sometimes regarded by Romany scholars as, called, as something called Pagadi Jib, which means the broken language, because it's considered to be out of use. But my view as I've got, you know, gone through this uh, journey with Romany is that a language can die through lack of use, sure but it can also die through lack of imagination. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do with it, is to imagine it back into life. And I suppose that means inventing, inventing new tales, which I, I claim are old tales, but they're not, the new tales told in Romany. Uh, um, this next poem uh, is probably goes to the heart of how I feel about this. And it contains some elements of the of that thing within the title, Fur the Fury. Yeah. You know. So I think we're going to hear now Romany Wounds Me. Yes. Uh, which um, is page eight for anyone who has the book already. This um, is dedicated to that guy I was mentioning earlier, Damien Labar, the Romany writer. Um uh, he's a, a good friend. Uh, we kind of we influenced each other a lot. Um for me, interestingly enough, this was actually uh, started off with a phrase from George Sepharis, the Greek writer, when he talked about the political state of Greece, where he said, uh, Greece wounds me, he said, and that was the start of the poem. That's as kind of much as I said. Um, Stow on the world in Kenilworth and Dareham and Horsewood and Appleby are all traditional uh, traveller horse fairs, and this uh, the protagonist is, ri is riding around to these fairs. It's very much a contemporary poem. Wherever I travel, Romany wounds me. As I hoved into the horse fur 
at Stowe on the Wold, between Cotswold chintz shops and the roving road. HGVs hunkered after our wagons on the Foss Way, cursing us with air brakes and grunting gear shifts. At Kenilworth Fair, with its tailbacks to Longbridge Roundabout, Vardo's bottlenecked behind ponies from Pershaw, rocks round on verges of all the villages between by neighbourhood watchers with the policeman's nod. At Derham Fair, I crowbarred the stone stones from the wayside and flattened fat molehills under my four by four and snored under the stars of headlights flying across the bypass and slung my kettle above an illegal blaze. At Gresson Hall, Swatham and Peterborough, the pubs were barred to me. What do the Gentiles want? These polite people who curse us were Romanian or worse than. A copper pulls us over and barks with passports. Mate, I come from Rotherham, laughs one gypsy, though it's foreign country around these parts. And as we sleep, Europe drifts away across the sea. The cling net of England closes. Our caravans are ships with their engines flooded. Our lives are drowning. Strange people, the English. They say, this land is ours. But they don't rove beyond their commutes or school runs. Imagine the coppers rocking up at their caravan sites. Meanwhile, England keeps on travelling, always travelling backwards. In my dream, a flotilla of caravans set sail from Dover's chalk shore as though the little boats of Dunkirk were our own gypsy vados, as though we were machine gunned by our own spitfires, and those brothers on the beach were our own straight kin, which we were, and we were borderless and one. Between the horse bears of Horsemondon and Appleby, at all the stopping places where I wake, and in every face I see. Wherever I travel, Romany wounds me. Thank you, David. And it's characteristic of the intricate binding of the book that the wound there takes us through to the the wound and wound that we had in the the throne voice and 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 so the poems work together um you're a very hard-hitting political commentator at the same time as holding back absolutely to let so many voices sound simultaneously i think um Time is time is moving, but I think we've got time for Apostle Birds, and I really don't want us to miss Apostle Birds because I would love people to hear um, to hear a different tone, I suppose, the aeratedness, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the travel of it. So um, this is a, a startling and funny poem that, that um, David's going to read now, and I believe the the prompt came from visiting uh, Shakespeare's birthplace in Stratford. Um, and I, rem I remember exactly what you, uh, when I visited, um, that there's this little glass pane uh, through which you can see the wattle and daub wall behind the plaster. So we can see what this house is made of. It's, it's wood and it's mud and it's straw. Um, and David made this magic connection uh, with, the with birds' nests and particularly with the nests made by another Australian bird, the, yeah, the Apostle bird. Yeah. I, I owe a lot to Australia. I've travelled around Australia a lot. I've done some teaching now. 
um, <clears throat> a puzzle bird, Australian puzzle bird, kind of gang up with uh, six to 20 other birds of the same species. And uh, kind of they do everything together. They, they team build a single nest. Uh, they sort of tell each other about it very loudly. That's where it came from. The poem's dedicated to Les Murray, a uh, very dear friend um, who, who died last year. Uh, the Apostle Birds. There were 12, no, there were 13 Apostle Birds scribbling with their beaks, their gooey manures nabbed from a billabong's edge. Snaffling straws of sedge from the parched Australian bush, bush dabbing sun dappled mash, testing and tasting and pasting the glues of a nest cup with their plastering, perimetering beak trowels. The whole gang goes up, blam, as one and lands again as three, bickering, jokely jostling over a job their selfless genes squawked sod's law at. The apostle birds go on scrappily scrabbling and shaping their small world's whirl of muck and straw, of happy dung and all, in which their featherless, brawling Shakespeare's will gape and call. I'm always reminded, by the way, that uh, little baby birds look just like Shakespeare. That's, that's where this came from. <laughs> little, you know, pre-fledglings have got that certain <laughs> kind of look about them. Both irreverent and sacred at the same time. I love it. Um, the bird is the poet, the poet is the bird. Um, David, our time is a little bit up, so I think we must we must sign off, but what I'd love to, to suggest is this arc through that you get in the book from the thesaurus of mimicry with which we started to uh, the line you have later on, the thesaurus of, of memory. Um, it's, it's a very beautifully achieved structure and lattice, uh, a wattle and or ball, so thank you. Oh, great, thank you very much, um, Susanna. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you very much, everybody here for listening and watching and sending in questions. It's been great. Thank you, David, and thank you, Alice. This is Susanna Herbert again. The sad news that it now has to come to an end because we have 45 minutes of amazing, um, I would say visual, even though we didn't have pictures, because I had, I had pictures in my head whenever David spoke. And I had to resist the temptation. I had the book with me, but I had to slightly resist the temptation to look at the words because the pictures conjured up by David's voice were so very strong. I want to thank you both and also to thank everybody who, was, uh, who posed questions. And apologies to those whose questions didn't actually get put. As you can see, it's, it's a poetry first kind of thing. And um, one day we will have enough time to talk about the poetry as well as to hear it. So hang on in there, we'll let you know when that time is. Now, if it just remains to you to buy the book, it is actually for sale. Um, well, you can buy it, I'm sure you can buy it. You can pre-order it, it will arrive on, on Thursday. Um, what I want to do is also to say that next week we've got Pascal Petit for the final, absolutely final, um, Forward Meet the Poets. And uh, please clock in then and come back and we'll see you and possibly have a celebration around, around everything that has been heard and said over these past few weeks, few months, thanks to Alex and the judges. Um, I'm going to leave the chat open for a little bit so that you can, oh, so, you know, the panellists can see it. So it's incredibly nice for them to see what you're saying, particularly Rebecca Gethin, who said, can we all stay for another couple of hours? Well, yes, um, <laughs> maybe not a couple of hours because my Zoom will kind of eventually die. But I mean, really, the more we know from you what works for you, the more we can make the argument to our sponsors and backers and the Arts Council that this is what really works for poetry and this is what works for the audience and for listeners and this is what inspires poetry in others. So on that note I'm going to mute myself um, and I won't end this but it's goodbye and thank you. <laughs>